All right, so turn to Exodus 26. We're looking at God's instructions to Moses concerning the construction of the tabernacle and all of its furnishings. As we've seen, Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai with uh, the Lord, and he'll be there for 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. And down below, at the base of the mountain, you've got two and a half to three million Israelites who are all camped out around the base of the mountain. And as I mentioned last time, they're all in their tents. And the tabernacle, it's basically God's tent. It's just a large tent. Um, God's presence would be manifested among the people there from the tabernacle. Uh, they would see the pillar of fire by night. They would see the pillar of cloud by day. Um, but it was also a place of sacrifice so that the people could have fellowship with God. And that's the key uh, to the whole, you know, building, not really building, but the tabernacle itself was a place to sacrifice in order for them to have fellowship with the Lord. Tents, they're very relatable. Pretty much every culture down through history has had tents. Uh, even today in the Middle East, in Israel even, you'll find Bedouins in their tents. Um, our uh, Native American friends, they had tents, also known as teepees in this country. Um, our settlers who came through back in the 1800s, they were all in the first RVs, uh, covered wagons. And um, basically, uh, you know, we can relate to this whole concept of tents because God talks about our bodies being tents, temporary dwelling places for us. This is what uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent... Groan. <laughs> the older you get, the more you groan. Being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And so presently we're all living in a temporary tent. And like any tent, they're not designed to last forever. And so when the rapture takes place and we're caught up into the presence of the Lord, we will receive our eternal homes, which is our resurrection bodies. Uh, glorified bodies will be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. There'll be no more dying, no more tears, no more death, no more sickness or disease. But as many of us can relate to now, our present tense, these bodies of ours, they're slowly wearing out. As years go by, I know the groaning gets a little more frequent, a little louder. But life in a tent in these physical bodies simply makes us hunger for the eternal dwelling place that God has for us. He's preparing a place for us, he says, and if he goes and prepares a place for us, he will come again and receive us to himself. Again, here's Moses on top of Mount Sinai. He's receiving from God the very plans for the tabernacle. And at the end of chapter 25, verse 40, it ends by saying, See to it that you make them, all the furnishings and everything about the tabernacle, according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And as we saw, the pattern, the blueprint that God gives him is of heaven itself. Literally, it is the new Jerusalem is what this is patterned after. And so, again, the main purpose of the tabernacle is to allow the Israelites to come into fellowship with God. And that took place through the sacrificial system that God would establish with them and as we'll see, they needed their sins to be atoned for, and this would be the place where their sins would be atoned for or temporarily covered. And it was through the animal sacrifices that the Holy God would fellowship with His people. Also remember that this tabernacle was to be portable. Whenever the, the pillar of cloud moved, they would have to Take everything apart in the tabernacle. They were, you know, he tells them, you need to put rings in it, poles through it, because they were going to be carrying all these uh, furnishings. The tent would be rolled up. They would carry all this stuff. And when the cloud would stop, then they would have to reassemble everything very quickly. And so they would do this throughout pretty much 40 years in the wilderness. And so 
the people would have to do the same thing. As soon as the clouds started to move, the Levites were in charge of the tabernacle, but all the people, they had their own tents, so they had to make sure they could roll them up quickly and follow the cloud as the, the Lord moved. And the Lord would be at the center of all the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember when Balak wanted to hire the wicked prophet Balaam to curse the Jews? This is towards the end of their wandering in the wilderness. He goes up on top of three mountains, and he wants to curse them. And all that would come out of his mouth is a blessing. But this was very organized. Every time they would move, you find it later on, uh, Moses had them in three different tribes going, you know, the tabernacle's in the middle. Then you had three tribes going this way, three tribes going that way, three tribes going this way, three tribes going that way. What does that look like? A cross. So every time Balaam was looking down at them, getting ready to curse them, he would see the cross. And it was pretty amazing when you see the tribes going this way were smaller, the tribes going this way were bigger, so it looked like a cross, and God would not allow them to curse his people. Now, we talked about the three furnishings that God told Moses to make. The first three furnishings, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top was the most important. Uh, this is the very heart of uh, their worship. This is where the blood of the Lamb would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. And once again, everything about the tabernacle was a picture of heaven, but also it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And for every New Testament truth, there is an Old Testament picture. Again, the ark is a picture of the sacrifice that Jesus would make. He's the final perfect Lamb of God who shed His blood once and for all for the sins of the world. Then they were told to make the table of showbread. And they would have 12 loaves of bread on that at all times. That would be in the holy place in the tabernacle. It was changed out once a week, but it also showed us that God would provide for the 12 tribes of Israel, not only in the wilderness, but also when they come into the promised land. God is their provider. Well, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. He is the one who gives us eternal life. He satisfies us for eternity. Then we looked at the gold lampstand, also known as the menorah. This was an oil lamp with seven receptacles that was always to be burning continuously. It was the only source of light in the, the tabernacle. And again, it points to Jesus. He is the light of the world. He's a source of truth, and in him is no darkness at all. But basically, the tabernacle was a tent that had a sturdy frame made up of poles and boards that came from the acacia tree, as we talked about last week. Uh, there were four different layers that went over the frame. You can look at this picture here. Uh, we might, you know, you can have a tent today and you'll have, you know, fiberglass poles. You'll have, you know, the rain fly that goes over it. And so that's, you know, not a whole lot of difference between the tabernacle and, and tents throughout history, except for this is God's dwelling place. Um, so it's layered here. You're only seeing portions of each layer. Uh, the bright one on the right, that would be the one on the inside, and then the other one would be over that, then the red one would be over that, then the final one would be over on top of all of them. And so they would all be on top, four layers over this thing. It was very dark, and so again, the lampstand was important because it illuminated the inside of the tabernacle. Uh, see the other cutaway one? Uh, it says, you know, the tabernacle itself. Yeah, go to the next one, too. So the tabernacle itself, from right to left, is 45 feet long. It's 15 feet wide, 15 feet tall, and it was divided into two rooms. You can kind of see the veil there. Um, you see where the man is standing, the high priest. He's walking towards the, you know, the altar of incense, going through the veil, and then on the far left would be the Holy of Holies. That was 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet, a, a perfect cube. There's another perfect cube because the real deal is in heaven, the, the, uh, you know, the, the city of God, you know, New Jerusalem. It's approximately 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. We find it in Revelation 21 and 22. And so that was New Jerusalem, the Holy of Holies, is where God and Jesus, their throne is in the midst of the Holy of Holies in heaven in New Jerusalem. So that's a place we will all dwell with the Lord in glory if you're saved. Okay, look at chapter 26, starting in verse 1. And it says, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of 
uh, fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. So this would be the first covering that we saw. This would be the inner covering over the tabernacle. And this beautiful covering could not be seen from the outside. It was only seen by the priests that would work in the tabernacle itself. There were different ones that could go in the holy place, but then the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go in there. Now, these colors were significant. Fine linen represents um, purity, you know, just the white. Uh, you have the blue fabric, speaking of heaven. You have the purple fabric, speaking of royalty. You have the red fabric that would speak of, um, or scarlet, it also speaks of blood. Again, the inside was beautiful, but from the outside, it looked rather plain. It was animal skins, and that's what everybody would see from the outside. Um, this kind of speaks of our relationship with God. Only those of us who are in Christ, you're born again, you're in Christ, so we get to see the beauty of Jesus. We get to see His goodness, His grace, His love, His mercy, His compassion. People on the outside, they can't see what we see about Jesus. They don't know the Lord. And so they think, oh, he's a good historical person. Oh, he's a great religious guy. No, they don't see what we see because we're in Christ. We see the very goodness and grace and mercy of God and his love for us. Notice also that the design has cherubim. That first layer we're looking at here has cherubim woven into this covering. And we find angels throughout the Bible. We find angels throughout Jesus' ministry. They announce the birth of Christ. They were there when he was beginning his earthly ministry after he'd been tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. And Satan tempts him. Then angels came and ministered to him. We find the angels with him in the Garden of Gethsemane ministering to him after he was sweating great drops of blood. And then after the resurrection, there's two angels in the tomb when he rose from the dead. So look at verse 2. Some of what we're going to read, I know it sounds a little tedious, but we'll get through it. Be patient. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits. Well, again, a cubit is about 18 inches from your elbow to your fingertip. It's about 18 inches on average. The width of each curtain, four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain on the selvage of one set. And likewise, you shall do on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is on the edge of the end of the second set, that the loops may be clasped to one another. And you shall make fifty clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with the clasps so that it may be one tabernacle. Again, this tent was designed to be portable. That's why you have all these loops and everything else. It was quickly folded up. They would roll it up. They would carry it away when the cloud moved. The same is true for us. When the trumpet sounds, our tents... These bodies of ours that we dwell in will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We need to be ready to move. You know, you want to be living for the Lord when the rapture sounds. First Thessalonians 4.16 tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So all those for the last 2,000 years who have died as born-again Christians, they get caught up first, then we are alive and remain. So if the rapture happened right now, we would all go up, this is us, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. So these are portable. <laughs> You're going to be moved in a hurry. Look at verse 7. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair, to be, so now he's talking about the next layers that go over the tabernacle. To be a tent over the tabernacle, you should make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain, 4 cubits. And the 11 curtains shall all have the same measurements. You shall couple 5 curtains by themselves, 6 curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the 6th curtain at the forefront of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set, and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set, and you shall make 50 bronze clasps, but put the clasps into the loops and together, couple the tent together, 
that it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the temple, and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side. This is like a rain fly. Rain fly? Is that sound right? Yeah. Uh, of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on the side and on that side to cover it. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. So if you put that back up, uh, the four cutaway ones... Okay, again, this is just the cutaway. All of these would be pulled over, so you'd have four layers over the tabernacle itself. The first one, again, was the beautiful one on the inside. The second one was made of woven goat's hair. And even that will point to Jesus, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, the third covering was the ram skins. They were dyed red, it says. That speaks of the sacrifice. Remember when God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, up on the Mount Moriah. You're going to sacrifice him to the Lord. And he's getting ready to, and then God stops him. And what's in the thicket? A ram. And that ram was then sacrificed in place of Isaac. So it's a picture of the ram that God provided. But Jesus is the ultimate. He's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The fourth covering, it says badger skins. Some translations say seal skins. Either way, that top layer would be the one on the far left there. That would be the animal skins. It would be like, you know, waterproof. It would make this tent, you know, waterproof. It would cover everything over. Whatever skin it was, the outer covering was nothing special to look at. It was rather plain in appearance. But again, this is a picture of Jesus. He was just a normal-looking Jewish man. You couldn't pick him out of a crowd. You know, he didn't walk around glowing white. He didn't have a halo hanging over his head. He didn't walk three feet off the ground. I mean, he just blended in. He could blend in. When they came to arrest him at times, he would just walk through the crowds. He blended in. He was a normal Jewish man, but he was also God with us, Emmanuel. What does Colossians 2.9 says? Say, Colossians 2.9, it tells us, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, Bodily, or in bodily form. So God himself dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. Look at verse 15. And the tabernacle you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. So we'll have a cutout of that. You'll see the boards in there. Jennifer can find that one. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of each board. And you shall make the boards of the tabernacle twenty boards for the south side. You got that picture of the cutout with the boards? You shall make forty sockets of silver. Uh, did I skip one? Under the twenty boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be 20 boards. And there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. For the far side of the tabernacle westward, you shall make six boards, and you shall also make two boards. For the two back corners of the tabernacle, they shall be coupled together at the bottom. And they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them, they shall be for the two corners. So there shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. Whew. Anyway, so each of these boards, as you can see the boards on the, you know, the cutout there, they're 15 feet long, they're all made out of acacia wood, they're 27 inches wide, and they're covered in gold, and they've got silver caps on each end, the top and the bottom. Pretty cool. Now, they were once trees, acacia trees, that were in the world. They were cut down, they were shaped, they were sawn, and then they were overlaid with gold, and now they're standing upright in the tabernacle. Kind of a picture of you and me. Our roots went into this world. We are part of this world system. God cut us down, so to speak, plucked us out of the world, and he is shaping us. He's cutting us. He's conforming us more and more into his image and likeness, and now we are able to stand upright before the Lord. They're all fastened together by these different 
you know, rings, and then there would be pole. You can see one pole across the very bottom there. That would link them all together. That would tie it in. And there would be one on the top, and then on the other side, and on the two ends, those poles. Then they'll have other poles that'll go across the top, like trusses, so to speak. Um, we'll see that in a moment. But the cool thing is, that's kind of like the body of Christ. We are all linked together. We're all hooked together by the Holy Spirit, and we need one another. We're not to forsake our assembling together as a manner of some, because we see the day approaching, and we need to be encouraging one another, because we are fastened by the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. Look at verse 26. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five boards... Bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle, for the far side westward. The middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold, make their rings of gold as holders for the bars, and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. So, again... You have the crossbars, one on top, one on the bottom, all the way around. And then you had these other poles going across the top, almost like trusses. And so when they would pull the different coverings over it, they would just go across the top and not sag down. Now, we get to the main part, the last eight verses here, um, or seven verses, if I can count. Verse 31 this is the, the key to the whole message, and hopefully this will speak to all of our hearts of what God is wanting to remind us of. Verse 31, You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from the clasp. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony, you know, that's the one Indiana Jones was trying to find, right? The Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, that, that, that will be in there behind the veil. In the most, Okay, the veil shall be a divider for you between, notice the holy place, that's the bigger section, and the Most Holy, also known as the Holy of Holies. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the Most Holy. Again, that's the lid that would go on top of the Ark of the Covenant. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle. That was the entrance into the main part. Woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Sounds like a lot of work. But he had to do it exactly as the Lord gave him the pattern. So, a lot to consider. The main thing here is this veil, and it says it's a divider. As verse 33 says, it divides between the holy place and the holy of holies. Again, the holy place is where the table of showbread would be, where the menorah would be, and then right up against the veil was the altar of incense, We'll talk about that down the road. That's not mentioned yet, but that would be in the, the holy place. On the other side of the veil was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat were sitting. It's in that veil. The, it's that veil itself that would separate holy God, because he would dwell in the Holy of Holies, from sinful human beings. Now, there was only one day a year and this went on for 1,500 years, not only with the tabernacle, but later with the temple of Solomon, and then the temple that Ezra and Zerubbabel built, and then when Herod remodeled it. So for like a 1,500-year period, the Holy of Holies, one time a year, the, whole, the high priest could go in there. It was the Day of Atonement. We know it as Yom Kippur, and he was the only person that could go in there and meet with the Lord, so to speak. I encourage you to write down Leviticus 16 because 
it goes into great detail about what took place on the Day of Atonement. That whole chapter deals with it. I'll briefly go through this. God required four animals to be brought to the tabernacle, then later the temple. Um, there was one bull, there was one ram, and then there were two goats. The ram, it would be sacrificed. It was a burnt offering, totally consumed on the altar that would burn it up. A burnt offering was offered to the Lord for the sins that the high priest knowingly committed. This is for him, preparing him to be able to go into the Holy of Holies. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would place his hands on the ram's head, confessing his sins over the ram, and then it would be burned up completely. That's what a burnt offering was completely consumed on the altar. This was symbolic of his sins being transferred to the innocent animal and then burned up on the altar as a substitutionary sacrifice. The next one would be the bull. They would take the bull, they would uh, drain blood out of the bull. The high priest would then go into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle blood from the bull on the mercy seat. And that was for sins that he unknowingly committed. And that, that was symbolic of him you know, repenting of his sins that he even know he committed. But then came the two goats. The high priest would cast lots for them, one lot would be cast for the Lord's goat. The other was cast for the people. And this would be the goat that would be used for a symbol for all the people to put their sins on this goat. We'll talk about that in a moment. So the, the Lord's goat, they would kill it. They would drain the blood out. He would go into the Holy of Holies. He would sprinkle blood of the goat on the mercy seat. Now, who saw that? Nobody saw it just a high priest. He's the only one that saw anything going on. You know, he's the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies. So the second goat, and this is the exciting part to me, is it's known as the scapegoat. Again, the second goat was for all the people to see. The high priest, he would put his hands on this scapegoat he would confess the sins of the people, not his own, because he's already done that. But now he's putting his hands on the goat as a, you know, a sign to all the people that we are guilty of sinning against the Lord. We need our sins atoned for or covered. And that would signify that the goat, this scapegoat, was now going to be released out into the wilderness and it was going to carry their sins away. So he would lead this goat, and it was a big procession. They lead the goat outside of the tabernacle, later outside of the temple in Jerusalem, and they would set up messengers, I don't know how far apart, but just leading out into the wilderness. And these messengers, you know, they would just make sure the goat kept running away from them. And it had the sins of the people on it. And the people are watching this. They're excited because they're watching this goat run away, and then they would you know, wait for the last messenger out in the wilderness. And as soon as he saw the goat disappear, it's gone. He would yell, it's gone. And then the next messenger, going back towards the tabern tabernacle, would say, it's gone. It's gone. And they go all the way back until they get to the final messenger by the tabernacle, by the temple. When he said, it's gone, there was a huge uproar. All the people would begin to worship and celebrate because... Their sins are gone. That's what the Lord has done for us. They would just be so excited. And it's not just because we are forgiven by the Lord, but our sins are gone. And that's an amazing picture of what Jesus has done for us. Yes, Jesus died for all of our sins. Yes, we are forgiven. But there's more to it. Your sins are gone. Don't forget this. They're not only gone, but they're also forgotten. Look at these verses, Psalm 103, verse 12. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's a picture of the scapegoat running away out of your midst. You can't even see it anymore. Hebrews 10, 17 says, Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. God sums it up like this in Isaiah 43, 25, when he says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Why? Because they're gone. 
That's so important for us to grab, grasp hold of. Jesus has forgiven us completely, has washed us clean by his blood thoroughly, and our sins, which lead to death, have been totally forgotten by God. And so that means your record of sins is gone. God doesn't have a record of your sins, past, present, and future. They're gone in his presence. Our guilty records have been destroyed, just like the scapegoat ran off never to come back. Our guilty records are now clean, never be to be brought up. Why is this so important for some of you to understand today? Well, think about it. Is there anything from your past that you regret? Yeah. Anything you might be ashamed of? Is there anything you said or did? Some immoral choice you made? Something you regret not doing or something you did do? Is there something from your past that Satan keeps bringing up and rubbing your nose in it? He tries to use it against you. He tries to use these things to pull you down when you're feeling weak, when you're feeling low, when you're feeling discouraged, when you're getting depressed. That is when Satan loves to bring up our past. He will try to condemn you. And if you feel beaten up and condemned, you need to realize, from God's perspective, it's gone. And you hold on to the fact of what God says and not what your feelings are, and you certainly don't want to be listening to the lies of the enemy. And if any of this is speaking to you, let me just remind you of this powerful truth. It's gone. Don't forget that. Because Satan will always bring it up. God won't bring it back. He has removed all of our sins from us. He has destroyed our pages of sins against us. This is why verses like Romans 8.1 are so important. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, why do you find yourself having things thrown back in your face so often? It's because we return to our past. We're new creations in Christ. Old things have passed away, but all things become new. But the old things have passed, but we keep going back to the past. And so, yes, you're going to give the enemy ammunition against you because it goes on to say there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it's because of the Holy Spirit that we are born again. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we are redeemed. It's because of Jesus as the substitutionary sacrifice for our sins we are now declared righteous. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it so perfectly, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's what we stand on. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But it's your responsibility to walk in the newness of life that he has given you. If you return to the vomit of this world, you're letting the enemy rip you off. You're letting the enemy throw these things right back at you, and you're going to feel beat up and condemned because you're living for the world and not for Jesus. And so may we always yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit because He is the one who will strengthen us, who will enable us to walk in this sinful world as new creations that Jesus has turned us into. And I hope and pray that you can remember these things because there's no sin, there's no combination of sin that is stronger than the blood of Jesus. His blood cleanses us of all sin. 1 John 1.7, 1 John 1.9. 1, so yes, there might be consequences from your past that you're still hanging on to or hanging around you, but the penalty of your sins and the punishment for your sins are gone. And that's because Jesus paid the price in full when he died on the cross for our sins. He took upon himself all the wrath all the judgment that we deserve. He took it upon himself when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father is pouring out his wrath and judgment on Jesus in our place so we won't have to face it. God did all these things for you and me simply because he loves you and me. And I can't think of a better passage of Scripture that ties this all together than Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Jesus, he wasn't spared. God allowed him to be beaten and tortured, nailed to the cross. That was his will for his son to take our place. That's how much he loves us. 
He delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Well, I know Satan does. I know others might. But who can bring these charges against our uh, God's elect? It is God who justifies. It's not your good works that are going to justify you. It's God who justified you. Who is he who condemns? Again, Satan does. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He's praying for you right now. He's interceding on your behalf. You don't have to live in defeat. He wants you to walk in victory. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for you shall, or for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He's saying, you're going to go through difficulties. You might be persecuted. We're seeing this in Northeast India. Brethren are being persecuted for their faith. They're getting their villages. Some of, some of the churches have been born, burned down. Others have been run out of town. I mean, these things happen. But God doesn't separate us from his love. He says, yet all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. That doesn't mean he's going to fill up your bank account. You're more than a conqueror because you can have victory even when you're being attacked by the enemy. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I hope that sheds a little more light on why it's so important to understand what happened within the veil and with this scapegoat. It took place, again, every year on the Day of Atonement. But once again, all these things within the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. Because in a very real sense, Jesus is our scapegoat. We literally put our hands on his head. We beat him mercilessly. If you were a Roman soldier beating Jesus, that was just like you beating Jesus. You nailed, you pounded that crown of thorns on his head. We're the guilty sinners. What's the first thing he said when he raised up on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. All of our sins were transferred onto Jesus. And so we read this in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was offered once to bear, that means to carry, like the scapegoat, carrying our sins away, to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Again, our sins were transferred to Jesus. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He carried our sins. He took them upon himself when he hung on the tree, that we having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Ask yourself, am I living for righteousness? Am I living for God? Or am I still living for this sinful world? You're going to get beat up if you're living for the world and your flesh, but you live for righteousness, and you're going to be amazed at what God can do in and through your life. 1 John 2, 2, and he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. What's that word mean? Simply, he satisfied the very wrath of God. We deserve his wrath, but Jesus absorbed it on the cross. So he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That means salvation is, you know, is for anybody. It's for everybody. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The potential is there for anybody to get saved. You just need to humble yourself and come to Christ for salvation. So anyway, you look at this veil, it separated the tabernacle into two parts, the holy place and the holy of holies, the most holy place. Again, as verse 33 says, the veil was a divider. It separated sinful people like us from the presence of the holy God. Let's fast forward 1,500 years. Let's go to about 32 A.D. on Passover day. 32 A.D. What do we find? Well, there's an amazing building on the Temple Mount, the, the very temple uh, of God at that point. It was known as Herod's Temple. Uh, Solomon built this temple. It was wiped out by the Babylonians when they came back from their captivity. 
you know, Ezra, uh, Zerubbabel, they rebuilt a temple, not all that spectacular. But then Herod came along and he remodeled that temple. And like everything Herod did, it was grand. It was huge. It was massive. You know, Jesus spent a lot of time in the shadows of that temple. It was the center of Jewish worship at that time. But since everything King Herod did was bigger and more elaborate, he made the veil in the temple 80 feet high, about nine inches thick. That's one giant veil. You know, that's hard to pass through. Even more difficult to get to the Lord. It says it had cherubim woven into it. Again, it represented the Garden of Eden. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and God put, put them out of the garden? This is what we read in Genesis 3.24. So he drove out the man. He placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God didn't want them going back there and eating from the tree of life in their sin because then they would be forever in their sin. So God in his grace put the flaming Air, a sword there to keep them out. The cherubim on the veil represent those angels who are like guardians to God's holiness, guardians to His glory. Again, only the high priest could pass through that veil once a year and sprinkle the blood of, on the mercy seat. But a wonderful thing happened. Passover day at 3 o'clock, we know the time, it tells us in the Bible, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Something amazing took place. This is when Jesus is dying on the cross for our sins. Three o'clock is when they would have the they slaughtered like 250,000 lambs every Passover. But that's, at three o'clock was the official slaughtering of the lamb that would go into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle the blood on there. That was a big deal at three o'clock. So what happens at three o'clock? Jesus is on the cross. And this is what we read in Matthew 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. What did he say? Well, John 19.30 tells us what he said. It is finished! And that's when he yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split. So again, at that very moment when Jesus died, that 80-foot veil nine inches thick, was torn in two from top to bottom. It's like God reached down and tore it because Jesus paved the way for anybody and everybody to come into the presence of God. Not just a high priest once a year, but now we have access. Again, the, the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. That's the throne of God in glory. That's why Ephesians or uh, Hebrews 4.16 says, you know, we need to come to the throne of grace. We can have boldness to come into the throne of grace where we can find grace and help and mercy in our time of need because that is where we can, we can all go into the presence of the Lord. I wonder what that sounded like. An 80-foot veil, nine inches thick, being torn in two from top to bottom. It's in Acts 6, verse 7, that we're told many of the priests got saved. There's a lot of priests on the Temple Mount during Passover, and they would probably hear it. Can you imagine just, I mean, what would that sound like? And everybody's like, what? And then there's an earthquake, rocks are split. Many people got saved. But what is the significance of the veil being torn? God is saying that once the ultimate sacrifice has been made, and Jesus paid the price in full for our sins, access to God is available for anyone. Any of you, all of you, can go into his presence and praise him, worship him, ask things, petition God. I mean, we can all have access into his presence. No more would a priest be needed. No more would you need somebody like a pope. No more animals would ever be sacrificed. At least they didn't need to be because Jesus is the final Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In fact... Jesus is the veil. Look at this verse, the last verse we'll look at. Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. 
He is the veil. He's the way into the throne room of God. He's the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through Him. Hallelujah. We can come boldly to His throne of grace and mercy. But you know what the sad fact is? It didn't take very long for the religious leaders to sew the veil back up. And for the next 38 years, they acted like nothing ever happened. And they continued to sacrifice and sacrifice. And they continued to have the high priest once a year go behind the veil, put the blood on it. It was worthless. It was useless. It was religion. Jesus fulfilled it all. And it wasn't until 70 A.D., God says enough is enough, and he allowed the Romans to come into Jerusalem, and they wiped off the temple. They, they, they took it apart, stone by stone, just as Jesus predicted, not one stone upon another. But isn't that typical of human beings? We would rather have our religion than have a relationship with the Lord. Don't settle for religion. Religion says, do this, don't do that. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come to me, and you'll find satisfaction. Come to me, Jesus says, and you will know what eternal life is all about. I've always gone by the philosophy of the, the KISS approach to ministry, K-I-S-S. -S. Not keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, saints. Jesus has done everything for you and for me and we can just enter into his presence 24-7 knowing he loves us, knowing that we are his children. And the Father says, come to me and I will bless you. I will encourage you. I will strengthen you. I will do whatever you need because he loves us so very much.